All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Coffee Q&A, your daily coffee live stream here at 10 Eastern, Monday through Friday here on the Ono Coffee Channel. I'm Jay, your host. How you all doing today? Good to see all of you. How's it going? So this is our last, uh, well, not, not last for the week, but we will have a, we will not have a live stream tomorrow uh, because I'll be traveling to Chicago for the Specialty Coffee Association's Expo, the annual gathering of coffee professionals from around the world. And actually, today's show has something to do with that. Is it a ripoff or is it worth it? You know, that's a good question. But really, the the, the question that prompted all of this was sent to me by Daniel Capote. Omniel, sorry, Omniel. Omniel Capote, who's one of our viewers. And he writes, do you know if tickets for the Chicago Expo can be purchased on site? And then, um, so, oh, that, that, didn't, that didn't mix nicely, did it? Mix? Okay. Okay. Um, Yes, yes, you should be able to buy tickets on site and register on site for the the event. Uh, it starts. You, I think registration is already opened at the McCormick Center in Chicago, so that's something that should be pretty easy to get to. There's Omniel. How are you, man? Good morning, and thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Of course, you're very welcome. I'm happy to do it. I'll be at the show regardless, being that my wife and I plan this trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you shouldn't have to worry about being able to secure your passes at the show. I mean, the, I, I don't think I've ever been to a trade show that didn't have, you know, available passes to, to buy at on site. It, it seems kind of dumb not to do that, right? Like you, you must be totally against having attendees if you're an organization that, that does that. And the only ones that I've known that, that do something like that um, are, are industries where, it's highly regulated. Like, for example, um, I will sometimes go to the cigar trade show, which is now called the Premium Cigar Association show, the PCA show that happened um, last month in Las Vegas. Uh, it'll be moving next year to New Orleans. But that one, because it's a trade industry only event, you have to have uh, certain credentials or certain proof to, of that you work in the industry or somehow related to the industry. And since my company has done so coffee blends for cigar companies um we have like allied um, association with the industry so i can get past if i want or you know and mom's with us good good michael good to see you as well all right let's see what else we have do you know the price on your live recently i heard you say something about 300 and that's what i saw on the website however the website is very unintuitive is it 300 just as a regular spectator wow that's crazy Someone told whom that it's only $25. Now, that sounds a lot more reasonable, but it's true. All right, so this is, um, yeah, you would have looked start, started looking sooner, but yeah, you, so here's how it works. There is there is a $25 pass that people have told Hoon about. However, that pass only allows you access to the coffee competitions area. There's a, a few years back, they separated the zones of the event from the regular trade show and conference part of it to a separate uh, competition area that's actually separated by physical walls or in last year's case in Portland, Oregon, there's a significant distance to a whole nother part of the facility. I don't know how they're doing it this year. Um, I'm not really involved in what they do, especially at the United States level, or it wasn't. And that's 25 bucks, which, you know, you, you know, it, it, there's, here's where my, my let, let me, let me pull up on, on their website to show you um, what we're talking about here. This is their website. This is the Special Coffee Expo's website. Oh, look at all those happy people. Starts in 14 hours. And the, where is the registration part? Show fee, attend. There we go. Register, registration information. So here's our badge pricing. These are the badge options. So at the at the lowest part is the USCC Hall badge. Now, I don't know why they're calling it the USCC Hall. It's a United States Coffee Championship, but they're, I don't think they're having any U.S. Coffee Championships. I think they're having um, World Championships. Oh, here we go. Oh, two. So they're separate. Okay, so there is a separate United States Coffee Championship Hall badge. So they're holding the U.S. Latte Art Championship and the Roaster Championship. Um, in a separate hall. That for that, you pay twenty five bucks. If you want to see the World Coffee Championship, so they're having 
uh, some of the world championships, I don't know what they're having. I'm no longer associated with world coffee events. They kicked me out. <laughs> quite, quite honestly, they kicked me out. And um, the, uh, they're having a couple of the world championships at the event. Not the, not the big ones, the, the, the small one. I don't remember which one they're having. But, okay, so as it says here, to view the World Coffee Championship, an expo badge must be purchased. So they're going to have a separate venue for the U.S. championships. The World Championships, I guess they're going to do it in the trade show floor area. So you have to have a regular badge to get in there. And that's where it starts to get expensive. So let's look at the one-day expo badge. So it starts Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Amyo says, I want to go and get as much content as possible for my small YouTube channel. Hopefully I run into it. For sure, for sure, man. And then Hoon and some of the other YouTuber creators that help push the code. Here's something that um, that I, I want to tell you about. If you're, if you're arriving tomorrow, I'm actually supposed to meet up with Hoon at some point in time. Because we get into uh, the airports uh, roughly the same time. Like he flies into Midway, I fly into O'Hare. So my commute is far, it's much farther into the city. But um, we were talking about meeting up, and he I think he wants to go see uh, – darn it. What is the name of that place? <laughs> uh, Deglo. I think he wants to see Deglo. But it turns out there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of um, events that are happening tomorrow that are pretty much open to anyone, I think. And you're welcome to come to that. Uh, let's see. Tomorrow – there's something called the World Cafe event at the Kimball Arts Center. And this is going to be an event that's um, a day-long event. There's a lot of great speakers. Jeff Watts. Actually, Jeff Watts was like, he was texting me about, oh, no, he was texting me about the Oscillations coffee event. That's that's in the evening. But um, Christopher Ferran, one of my friends in Ohio, great coffee buyer, really forward-thinking in, in coffee. He's giving a talk, I think, at 3 p.m. at the Kimball Arts Center, which is where Dayglow is. Because I, I messaged him, I said, "Hey man, where's this place you're doing?" And he's like, "It's at the Kimball, and it's uh, next to Dayglow." So, I guess we're gonna go there at some point in the afternoon. Um, you're welcome to come to that. So, the World Cafe event at the Kimball Arts Center, and that starts at 1 p.m. and goes till six, or I'm, I'm sorry, it starts at noon. Because I'm looking at my phone here, and it has uh, East Coast times. And then there's an Oscillations Coffee event that is being held at Reggie's Rock Club tomorrow night starting at 6 p.m. And that's, again, a night. It's going to, supposed to be an evening of music and arts and coffee. I, I don't really understand. Trey Elder, one of my friends, he used to work for Intelligentsia years ago, was like, hey, man, you need to come to this. Jeff Watts called me yesterday. He's like, dude, you're going to come to this? I was like, all right, all right I'm coming. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. So those are some things to keep in mind for tomorrow. Um, but you can go down to the center tomorrow and register. I will not be going to the center tomorrow because it is far away. McCormick Center from you know, the Miracle Mile where I'm staying in the, in the Loop area is kind of far. So if you take the train, it's 30 minutes or 40 minutes. If you take the taxi or Uber, it's 15 minutes. And so that would just be an extra expense that I'm just like there to get a badge and then that's not worth it. So I'd rather go to these other events. And uh, so that's what's going to be happening tomorrow. So take that in mind. And then tomorrow and then Friday morning, I have a cupping at 8 a.m. Philippine coffees. If you're interested, there's a place for cupping Philippine coffees. 8 a.m. Um, the number, the room number is, is S405 Bravo. Come check that out. That's all, all the Philippine coffees. Really, really beautiful stuff from the Philippines. Very unknown, really um, not tremendously respected coffee growing region, but beautiful stuff is, is produced there. Like I work with some of the farmers over the years in southern uh, Philippines as well as now in Bataan. And there's some beautiful stuff coming out of there. So hopefully there'll be some nice stuff for you to check out. It's a shame that regular folks will need to pay so much money. To, you know, and that's, that is the case. And so let's, let's go back to the badge pricing because that's really what kind of bothers me. So we've got the one-day expo badge for Friday or Saturday. And this includes access to the, the following on one pre-selected day, Friday or Saturday. You get the exhibit hall, the USCC hall, the SCA lecture series, all show features except for ticketed events, public cuppings and the cupping exchange. So those are some nice things to have at $219, though. And it's like, wow, $219. That's that's a lot. Now, let's say if you go to Sunday one-day badge, it's $109 for the same thing. 
I guess the nice thing, if you go to Sunday, the, the competitions, if you're really into the competitions, those will have, you know, you'll get to see the finals on those days and you get to see who wins the championship. So if that's important, that's a good way to, to try to save your money. But really, here's the thing. The, the one that they really want you to buy, of course, is a three-day expo badge because it's three days and you get all of that. But it costs you $400. I mean, $400. That's a lot of money. Especially for this is the part that, that just that just that just boggles my mind and just irritates the crap out of me. It's like you want people to pay four hundred bucks to attend, and you don't give any options. Like give us give people a trade show pass that's either cheap or free. For example, on Monday, once so this show ends Sunday, Monday morning. Like I'm hopping the first flight out of O'Hare and flying directly to Las Vegas because the trade show that I normally attend before SCA is now conjoined. And that's a trade show called the NAB show. Whoops, the, NA, the NAB show. And this is a, this is a show that's, that's geared towards television production, you know, all sorts of production, you know, video, television, Motion picture, a little bit of motion picture. The, the, the motion picture ones are actually different ones. Like Cinegear, LA, New York, and, and Atlanta are the bigger shows for, for actual like motion picture production equipment. Uh, but NEB has a lot of that stuff. Like Airy Cameras has an incredibly large booth at that. Sony brings out a, a massive presence. Um, so if you're into production, which some of you may be, <laughs> most of you may not be, but uh, that's it's something that I'm really excited and fascinated about. So, actually, I know a bunch of YouTubers. We always get together at this at this event now, and so we're all planning to hang out and uh, just meet up at least. And then, but this show, right? Like, let's let's look here at their. How do we exhibitor attraction features register? Let's see what they say for registration. N10D. Oops. Attendee. Oh, anyway, it doesn't, you have to like, oops, you have to like sign in for all this stuff, but um, we won't do that. I already have a, I already have a signed up registration for it, but basically the thing about NAB, it's a massive show. It takes up like three halls of the Las Vegas Convention Center. And one of them is strictly, de mostly dedicated to transmission, like television broadcast transmission. And so I'm totally like have no idea what's going on there. But the other two are really about production and live streaming and all this stuff. And you can get free trade show passes. They'll give you free trade show passes. Like the NAB itself is giving away codes. Like anything, it's NAB04, and you get a free trade show pass. You don't if you want classes or other lectures, you'll have to pay. But if you just want to come to the trade show and see the show see where the products are, visit with vendors, that's totally available. And that's something where I think the SCA totally falls down on. It's like, you want, we want to have more people attend. We want to have more people see what's going on, get excited about our industry. They don't care about that. They just don't, they, they, you charge $400 for people to attend and that's your, really, that's your only real option. You don't really care, right? On the website, it says that, uh, they like to tout that there's something like 12,000 people that are attending. And I'm like, maybe, but why not get 20,000, 30,000, right? If that's the case. And I think that by, you know, and you, and I don't think you'll lose a lot of revenue. You know, you'll, if, you, if you want people, people want to attend lectures, you can still charge them. But the trade show for it, give them passes, for God's sake. Let people see, let people get excited, let people meet, let people become part of the industry. But... They missed the mark on that. And a lot of the shows that I'll go to, like, for example, Cinegear Expo in um, New York City or Los Angeles or even Atlanta, you go there, you register, it's free to join. Man, that, that event's totally free. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Omniel says, I might have to end up just going on Sunday. Yeah, I'm, I hear you, man. I totally hear you on that. Um, I, I will tell you one thing, that if you're really, really interested, there is some... They they do so. Exhibit hall vendors are given 
some passes to give to their clients, right? And if you if you know anyone in, that's that has a booth at the show, you might want to reach out to them. Sometimes they may have extra trade show floor passes, and it'll be just for the trade show floor. And they're only two day passes, but it'll give you a little bit more access. Um, yeah. So that's unfortunately the the reality of the show. Like you know, if you went to NAB, you totally could get in for free and shoot video to hearts galore and have to battle with all the other vloggers. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Let's see here. Michael says, coffee sounds very similar to architecture conventions. Way too expensive and exclusive. I mean, and this is the problem. We're not even that exclusive. The, the NCA, the National Coffee Association, that's the exclusive organization. This is the one that's supposed to be grassroots. This is the one that started as a grassroots organization to try to, like, foster specialty coffee and build specialty coffee. And now it's this behemoth that has just really lost touch with its people. Like, most people that I, a lot of people that I know that are in the business, especially the ones that have been in as long or longer, are really kind of no longer enamored by the SCA. Like it's really, I think the SCA has lost its way and it lost its step, lost its way in many respects. It is a money grabbing, hungry machine that, um, yeah, that just like they get, they get, they do certain things like that. I remember they had this one opening ceremonies where they asked these two, this is before vlogging and, and YouTube really became popular, but they, there were these two kind of coffee celebrity kids and they had them, they had this, this, these two people come and be the, the host for it. Totally missed the mark. Like these guys were like people that were like social media people. They were like, you know, on Instagram, they weren't like on YouTube. So they don't really have presence. And they were like, just bombing the whole time. And it's like, wow, this is painful to watch. Like their jokes, the way they acted. It's like, ah, yeah. Yeah, and I agree with you, Omnia, exactly. You want the regular folks to get excited about the whole thing. Yeah, and, well, yeah, but here's the other side. Okay, let, let, me, let me rewind a little bit on that. That I agree with you too, that we want people to get excited. We want, especially industry people to be excited. Like we want, we really want to see more industry people attend and participate in the SEA, especially when I was a part of the SEA doing a lot of the volunteer work for the SEA itself. And then I was one of the people that started the Barista Guild of America. We really wanted to get more participation. So we really were trying to push for that. Now, the other side of it is that, you know, we're at a trade show. And so, like, I see this especially in the Premium Cigar Association show. Like, at the PCA show, you don't, we don't really want to have a lot of um, public just smoke, cigar smokers, right? We don't want that a lot of the gawkers because these guys, you know, especially the ones that will come, they're super geeky. They're super geeky into, into cigars and they want to come and they want to talk to the manufacturers because they're excited, they're enthusiastic, which is great. But that vendor, that manufacturer's rep, needs to sell product. He needs to make his, they need to make money so they can justify the fact that they spent, you know, how many tens or to hundreds of thousands of dollars to be there. And so the, in that industry, they're very much against having enthusiasts come. And in this one, I think we, there, there should, there, there can, I think there can be a balance here. I think at one time we did. Oh no, that was that was that was the PCA. Um, in coffee, we've never been that hardcore because I think we've always been more interested in getting more people to attend. But now they're just like you know, we just want, you just pay, just pay big money, and you can come. And Omnil says about Michael's Cabal Coffee, at least if you're an architect, perhaps you could afford that. But this is coffee. I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, I went to, I, I don't know if it's, it's it's something that you kind of have to, there's part, I think there's both sides of it, you, what you can afford and what you desire to afford. Like I went to this video conference called Vid Summit uh, in 2022. It was in, it was in October and it was held in Los Angeles. And it's it truly is the big YouTube creators conference. And I was like, I need to go to that. Now, there's another one called VidCon that is also for creators, but also for fans of YouTube YouTubers. That's held in Anaheim in June. And that is a madhouse. Like from what people tell me, it's a madhouse in there. Like there's the section for the creators and then there's a section for the fans. And the fans are just, it's just insane. Like you see the videos on YouTube, you're like, oh my gosh, that's craziness. And I took my nephew to VidCon Baltimore, which is a smaller event. And that was that was fine. It wasn't as crazy as Anaheim. 
But I also went to the Vid Summit, and that one is really geared towards YouTubers who are very serious or serious about YouTube and not really for fans. And they price it to the point where if you're a fan and you, want, you, you it's a thousand dollars to attend just for the registration. And that helps to keep the fandom out because they're like, okay. And we're talking about, we're not talking about small creators. We're talking about this one has like, you know, the, it's got the one that I went to in LA had Matt from Matt's off road recovery. They had, um, I mean, Mr. Beast was there. Mr. Beast came and did a big talk. And there's a lot of really significant sized YouTubers that are at this event um, speaking, and then you can engage with them. And, so in that respect, it, it's not too bad. I mean, like, and I'm certainly not in a position to like be spending a thousand dollars a year. Like I didn't go to the 2023 event because I was like, well, it's kind of pricey. So, you know, it's just a matter of like, you can't fault people for doing well in their careers. And then, you know, and Craig says, sounds like they want to keep the riffraff out, out of a uh, PCA for sure. SEA, I don't think they can. They just want the money. They, uh, SEA doesn't have any requirements as to what industry you are and how you're related to the industry. As long as you pay, they'll give you a pass, right? At the PCA, you do have to produce, prove your credentials. And Omnil says, after all, we are the ones buying the equipment. The I mean, it, it, it seems to me that it would serve the vendors better to be open to show us up to as many people as possible because they're making deals. Vendors are making deals. Like, you know, they're, they're trying to sell products. So they're going to make a deal with you. Like um, this Mal Koenig had a great, crazy deal last year for Grinder. So my buddy, Matt, he bought like four of them. <laughs> I was like, Oh dude, that's crazy. I'm too cheap to buy Grinder. I'm like, I'm going to stay with the old ones. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff we had and I just wish they would be more, you know, I don't think a lot of people are very happy. Like I know a lot of vendors who I talked to in the previous years, they just aren't showing this year or they've either they've stopped showing at SCA or they've reduced their presence. Like, you know, one grinder company I know they used to have a big booth and I used to hang out with them at their booth. And the last couple of years, they've just been going to the roasters. There's a roasters forum area where you can, where it's just smaller, small roasters can buy a little booth space and they support that in a much smaller fashion than they used to. Oh yeah, bald head says PCA really keeps people out, but that show us for selling. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Definitely very strict about that. Although, you know, my friends, a lot of my friends from Hawaii, they're there. They're like hanging out. I'm like, what are you guys doing here? Like, let's go out to eat. <laughs> and Michael says, exactly, not designed to purchase a 1000 k Excluding, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a thousand plus plus of your expenses. It's that vid summit is is pricey. And I, you know, I went to it. I thought I had a great time. Met some really interesting YouTubers with much bigger channels, a lot of insight. Then the the sessions were were really good. But I don't know. I wasn't so hyped about it after attending that I was like, I need to be there next year. Right? Maybe I'll try to go this year in 2024 because it's it's being held in dallas this year and i kind of would like to go down to dallas and and go check out kirby allison's place i don't know if you know kirby kirby's a, a youtuber that that does a lot about like menswear menswear shoes he he's a cuban cigar aficionado kind of guy and so i was like and he built this new like facility at his at his offices and i was like i wonder if he'll let me come and have a viewing <laughs> maybe enjoy a cigar with him <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. The, the 1,000 on the is, is a lot. But is it worth it to go? I mean, I mean, I'm, you, know, you, you said that. So I, I wasn't sure if you were industry or if you were just doing YouTube videos. But, it, you know, if you're industry, it, it is it, 400 bucks is not a, not a little bit amount. Of, it's not a small amount of money. E even I think that that's a lot of money, especially when I can consider other shows that are much larger or even smaller that cost less or free. I do think that 400 bucks is a lot to spend. You know, and for me, I don't really go, I don't really do the lectures. Like you know, the lectures are fairly pedestrian. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I have no way to, I have no way to say that without, um, let's see here. Let's look at what they have. Let's see what they have here. Uh, lectures.
like, okay, let's see what they're having. Okay, Friday, April. And I, I said, I said, you know, kind of basic because you know, for the over the years, it's like, okay, there's not too many interesting things that I've seen on the schedule that I was like, I need to go to that. But let's have a look here and see. We've got green coffee lifespan at 9 a.m. Building sustainable communities and environments through coffee. Inventory manager fundamentals for green coffee buyers. Delving into coffee sweetness perception. Um, the business science and sustainable nexus in African coffee cultures. De-escalation training for baristas. Gosh, is that is that really an issue nowadays? De-escalation training. I wonder what kind of you know. I have to wonder, like, what kind of place do you have that you need to worry about de-escalation? Brewing change, interpreting and involving specialty coffee mindsets and value distribution, food safety. Food safety is, you know, from from my perspective as an operator, that seems like an interesting. Oh, sorry, food safety seems like an interesting. And JJ3 says they've had the same lecture lineup for the, for 13 years or 10 years. Yeah, that's the problem, JJ. I tell you, man, a, a lot of the stuff I see, and here's one of the things like this. There's one like, there's this one, I don't know if they have it this year. They normally have it every year. They'll have things on like coffee shop design, which is interesting to me. But it's the same person or same company that's been doing this lecture for the last 20 years since I've been in the business. and. I've sat in it a few times, and it's always the same spiel. It tells you just a little bit, but not really anything to help you at, as an attendee, other than the fact that, hey, you should give them a call and use their services. Of course, they do coffee shop design. And it's like, it's just a sales pitch. And it's like, man, I'm spending this money for that. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's... There are some interesting things, I think. I mean, there's a lot. Actually, there seems to be a lot more. Sorry. There seems to be a lot more now on Friday than I thought there would be. Brazilian certification protocol, coffee industry investment in farmers is an investment in yourself. I mean, here, here's something. Coffee industry and investment in farmers is an investment for you in yourself. And that's an interesting topic. But, you know, who is this? Who is the trade show really geared for? It's really geared for you know, specialty coffee operators. And most specialty coffee operators are small. They don't have the kind of resources to go out and support farmers. They don't really have the resources to do direct trade or to travel to origin. Travel to origin is something that we talk about a lot in this business. And like, it's so expensive, right? If you imagine you have to fly, let's say to Nicaragua, you fly to Nicaragua, it's six to $800 for the flight. And maybe they'll put you up. If, if you have a relationship with this farmer, they're going to put you up. So you'll have like maybe three days at the farm for free, oh, technically free. But that that's still a lot. For most operators, I think it's still going to be a significant amount of money to invest. And if you're not buying a good amount of quantity, like how do you spread that out? If, you buy, if you're like, I, I, don't, I only need to buy like 10 bags, a pallet, you know, 1,500 pounds, like you're now sp spreading that expense across 1500 pounds. So it's adding what a dollar maybe to your to your pound cost if you can land it in the US at 1500 at 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 that price. So I don't know. It's it is a it's it's a I don't know we we try to promote this a lot which is good because we want to support we want farmers to do better. Oh, I don't even know if people want farmers to do better. I think they want the story that they're doing better that they're doing something altruistic to help these poor campesino farmers. But I don't know. The campesino farmers, like, they just don't have, and then they want, they want to help the campesino farmers, and then, but they want the campesino farmer to give them, you know, 85, 87 plus scoring coffees when that campesino farmer is in his position because he doesn't have a lot of resources. He's relatively poor. He doesn't have a lot of resources, and it becomes very difficult for him to take the extra time to process the coffee so that he can try to get an 85 out of an 82 coffee, maybe. And then most of the, the buyers are like, well, if you don't deliver 85, we're not going to give you the price we're, we're talking about here. It's like, well, what's the incentive for the guy to do it? The guy's, got, the guy's a campesino farmer. He's got to feed his family tomorrow. He could just sell the coffee to the, the cherries, to the coyote. That's coming by this tomorrow this in the afternoon to pick up cherries. It won't be as much as the green that you're the 85 green that you're getting that you're telling them you're gonna pay. But that'll take another month or two to make. 
whereas he can just sell it now. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, and the truth of the matter is that the people that I've been able to buy coffee from consistently, year after year after year, that is of very good quality or very high quality, very excellent quality, they're not campesino farmers. They're actually probably part of the one or ten percent of their nation. So if I'm, you know, if I'm paying, I don't know, extra two, three dollars a pound to this producer who's very well educated, very well financed, you know, lives well. Is that really helping the farmer? Is that the story we're telling? Because that's the story that I see being told, and I'm just like, what are these guys talking about? Not to say these guys aren't doing great work. They're doing amazing work. But they're able to do amazing work because they can. They have the resources. They have the wherewithal. They have the knowledge. They have the education, the training. You know, one of my good friends in the business, like he's a great coffee producer. He went to the best school for agriculture in South in, the, in Central America. Like it's the one in Costa Rica that's, I think it's Costa Rica, that's super well regarded. Like I have three of my friends went there and I'm like, they're, they're all, they all do very well for themselves. So me saying to my clientele, my customers, oh yeah, we work with these farmers. We're helping them. We're not helping, I'm not helping nobody. I'm, I'm supporting the industry. I'm supporting my friend's business. I'm supporting them. And in turn, they are, you know, they're paying their workers a, a premium over the regular rates. But if when we think about things like, oh, the, I, I think the inherent message in all of this is that, oh, we're, we're helping lift the farmers out of their poverty. And no, we're not doing any of that. Nobody's doing, nobody's doing that. At least I have yet to see it. And I've been in the field for quite a few years now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not babbling. I'm sorry about that. Omnio says, I'm just a regular dude. I hear you, but man, I totally hear you on that. And JJ says, that, oh man, I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's just a pitch. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I wish they would stop doing that. I wish they would give us more. And like I've had, I've sent a couple. Um, so every, every year you can send into the SCA some topics that you'd like to present. I've sent a couple, I've just, I've only done like maybe three times, but I had a couple of topics that I thought that would be interesting. That would be, that, would, that wasn't sales pitchy. I wasn't because I'm not trying to sell people coffee. I don't care to sell people coffee at the show they were all rejected you know and i try to bring a balance of like professionals together to do the the presentation the presentations baldhead says that origin trip is a staff perk yeah i mean yeah for sure for sure if, if you've got a business that is doing well enough that you can send staff to origin more power to you man that's really a great thing and i, and I think that's a beautiful way to do because it, it just gives people so much more insight. Like, it's one thing for a barista, let's say if a barista or your, gosh, even the guy packing the coffee in the roastery, if you're able to send them, if they have an interest in it and you're able to send them to origin, they get to see the farm, they get to see the farm, they get to see the process, they get to really understand on a firsthand level really what goes on to make the coffee that they are selling. I think it gives greater dimension, greater depth to, to your personnel. And uh, there's, no, there's no real downside to that as far as from a, a, a personnel improvement and education standpoint. I think it's, it's amazing. It's just expensive. You know, it's just expensive. Farmers forming cooperatives is the traditional model. Yes, yes, they do. And so I remember we worked with, we we're trying to put together this one deal with this cooperative in Guerrero, Mexico. and. That, that was one of the big issues we had with the, within this co-op. There was a, a wide disparity of the farmers. Some were fairly well capitalized and others were not capitalized at all. And, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's difficult. The, the, it's, it, it is easier to work with better capitalized. And, and the other side was, I remember this one woman in Colombia one year. She came out and she did the auction thing. Or she, you know, they they did this kind of like couple of excellence thing where her coffee did really well. Like it did beautifully well. And people were so hungry for her coffee that year. The next year, her coffee didn't do as well. So they weren't so hungry for her coffee. So her coffee didn't really move. Of course, she was very disappointed because you know it's not that the coffee was bad, it just wasn't this darling coffee that it was the year before. And that's the difficult part, you know, like I think with the, the, the smaller campesino farmers, 
when they have a, a, a knockout home run coffee, it's not because they know how they did it. It's not because it was a, a thoughtful, necessarily a thoughtful process that can be replicated year after year. It would just so happen that whatever they did that year was just at the right moment that they were able to produce this beautiful coffee. But they may not have known how they did, they were able to produce that coffee, so they can't really replicate it. They don't really know how to like replicate it. Whereas the, the more capitalized or and more resourced farmers, they know how to re they can replicate it because they're they're measuring things. They're they're they've got the wherewithal to do all of that. They've got the resources to do all that. They've got personnel to do all of that. You know, if you're a small cappuccino farmer, you're just maybe by yourself and your kids trying to like harvest coffee and make something to eat. Eduardo says in Mexico Expo Cafe, it's also expensive. Taking into account that in the same venue there are expos that are free, it's cheaper to send a coffee sample for a contest and get. A... See, that's probably the best way to go. I mean, that I don't. Yeah, again, I don't know why. Well, I, I guess in that in Expo Cafe, you know, Arturo has followed the SCA guidelines. You know, he, he's very much involved, or he's been very friendly with the SCA over the years. And don't get me wrong, Arturo Hernandez, I've known him from twenty years. I really like the guy. I really respect what he does. I really respect him. Like, he was my judge in the competitions for many years, especially the one that I was the most the the wildest presentation that I did was in Long Beach in 2007. So I really love that guy. Really, I consider him to be a personal friend. But, but I you know I think in, in Arturo's case, if, if Expo Cafe is, is a lot of money for attendees in Mexico, then it's it's following that SCA model, which. It's a shame because SCA really needs to like revamp their thing and like really rethink about how, whether or not they're, who are they serving? They, they need to think about who they're serving. They're serving themselves. They're not serving the industry. They're not serving the community. They're not serving the people. And Paul Head says, I went on a tuna processing trip. Oh, that's fascinating. Was that like up in the, up by Alaska? Like I, my friends work with a guy that helped to import our coffees for number for many years. This guy is a tuna or a fish guy, and basically he has a floating platform somewhere in the in the Baltic sea, Bering Sea, and boats will harvest. Maybe it's maybe it's crab. I don't know. They they harvest. They're out trolling. They're harvesting, and they'll come to this platform unload their fish, their haul, and then they'll, it's flash frozen wherever they, I don't know, I don't know if they flash freeze on the boat. I think they do on the boat, not on the, on the platform, but the platform. And so instead of having to go back to Alaska, they just go out in the middle of the sea, drop off their load. And then, I mean, it's crazy operations. I, I mean, I've, I've only heard about it. I've never been, that, that sounds super fascinating. And Craig says, excellent weather that year. For what it's worth, if a roaster says that they buy from the same farm every year, no matter what, and buy the same quantity every year, then that I, I totally agree. That is definitely a real relationship. And like, you know, and that's one thing I remember. I was one on one trip one year to Central America and with a couple, a couple of buyers that I knew. And they all knew the same. We were at the same farm and we're visiting with the farmer. And I remember this is such a, this has always been something that I remember. The coffee we were cupping that day was probably like 82, 83. So decent quality coffee, nice blender, basic coffee, really nice quality, right? Not, not like an award winning stellar example, but just solid coffee. And the farmer was asking 235 a pound. This is a farmer that I've done business with for quite a few years by that point. And I know that. The people that were also there had been doing business with them quite a few years. And I remember we were sitting outside one night talking about the coffee. And they're like, I don't know, man. I could fly down to Columbia tomorrow and buy the same quality coffee, 82, 83, $4.90. And I was like, well, yeah, but why would, like, why? Like, I don't know. For me, it's like, as long as coffee's within a decent range of cost, I think in, in a lot of respects for me, the, the relationship kind of outweighs that that variance, right? So we're talking for, and 40 cents a pound, if you're buying, and these guys are buying container loads, so it does add up, you know, the container is 40,000 pounds. At a 40 cents, you're talking a, a wider variance. I'm not buying in such a larger quantity, so my variance is a lot less, so I have a little bit more tolerance for price swings. But I'm still like, you know, it, it's not like it's tremendously 
huge difference. And this is someone you've worked with for many, many years. I don't know. I totally agree with you on that, though, Craig. And JJ says, one thing that bothers me regarding SCA is the lack of focus on origin. Huge missed opportunity when SCA became European instead of Pan American. Could have really connected roasters and producers. Oh, I hear you on that. You know, that's interesting to see that. Because honestly, I have always thought that, I've always, um, I've always kind of felt that the SCA did have, I always thought that the organization did have fairly decent uh, focus on origin because they, they always have the origin countries. Of course, I'm sure the origin countries pay for that privilege. You know, Ethiopia is the, the whatever. I don't know who the, the origin country is here, but I'm sure whatever coffee organization is, they paid a lot of money for that. Um, and then when the merger came a few years back with the Special Coffee Association of Europe. So here's here's what my understanding of this. So it's SCA, Special Coffee Association of America, SCAA, was where it started. And there's an educational program that the SCAA built. The SCAE started and they built their own educational program. And evidently the SCAE's educa coffee education programs were more prevalent in other parts of the world outside of, especially in Asia where like the Asians, Koreans, Japanese, I think especially the Koreans and maybe the Chinese to a certain extent and definitely Southeast Asians. Evidently they go buck wild for these certifications. Like, like, so many Q graders are from that part of the world because there's some level of prestige by having the Q grader status. There's a lot of prestige in certifications in certain cultures. Um, I grew up in the United States, so I don't really understand that as much, right? From, for, from my perspective, certifications are great if your company requires you, or if, or if you need that for professional advancement. It's good to get education, don't get me wrong, you wanna educate yourself and, and learn more, but to be certified for something like, like Q graders, like I don't care about Q grading. Like, I mean, it's Q certification because unless my job requires it, why do I need that? Like I, I know I cup, I cup with Q graders, we cup the same things and we cup the same scores. So it's like, but you know, and in my position in my company, it's not gonna help me with upward mobility, right? So the, the, everyone has to look at it for themselves. But in those parts of the world, it's very popular for certifications. And so the SCAE had better recognition, but the SCAE evidently was not as financially strong. But they decided to merge. And I don't know why they decided to merge. I'm maybe because I'm a maybe because I'm from the United States and I have this corporate raider mentality idea, you know. <laughs> we just want to maybe the whole thing about being American is we want to conquer the world, right? But not these guys. They were like, let's merge. And I was like, well, why would you want to, if the SCA is in financial difficulty, why not wait till they're like are about to topple? And then you just take them over. And then you don't have to give anything. You can just take, take, take. Right. Because I, I I'm I'm from the United States. I can't, I grew up in this industry and I grew up with the SCA as, as my in the industry. So for me, I'm always like, we need to win. Anyway, that's just that's just ridiculousness talking. But the uh, they, they decided to merge, and I hear you. There's a lot more European people involved in the SCA now than there were, and maybe that's where some of the 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 money hungriness comes from. I don't know where that really comes from. It's 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 a lot of obfuscation, pretty much, in the organization. So no one really knows. They used SCA used to be a nonprofit. The SCA is is a profit and. And, um, enterprise. So that kind of tells you a lot about it. And Craig says Atlantic Canada. Okay, okay, huge tuna for so for oh so out in the on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, huge tuna for sushi. I've, I've been to the auctions at Tsukiji Market, not to the new, not at Toyoso. I've only been to Tsukiji for their auctions. It's good to see that once, and then unless you're really in, in, into it, it's like okay, that's cool. Like we, we got up at three in the morning. Trucked over to Tsukiji. This is back in 2007, and got to see them. They got to see the tuna auction, like amazing. Two froze big frozen tunas, really awesome. And Craig says, "Auditing to assure the integrity of the supply chain for sustainability." So, oh, okay, okay, that's. And then, <laughs> me for SCA press, that would be something. 
They would not be happy with it. They, they would not like me to be the president. But actually, the president doesn't really do anything. What you need to be is executive director because the executive director, they pay, they pay you, what, $400,000 a year, I think, at, at least. They're probably more by now. This was, I think they were paying $380,000 a few years ago, so it's got to be closer to half a million dollars now. Um, presidents only last a year or maybe two. It's like, what can you do in a year? You can't do anything in a year, especially in an association that meets sporadically and is spread all over the world. It's like, how do you make a change in that? JJ says, I just think they could have incorporated all the Americas for a hemisphere spanning org that would have really been a farm. Yeah, but the problem, here's the problem. Okay. I, I totally hear you. I totally do not disagree with you, but here's the problem. Farmers don't have money, right? Most farmers do not have money. Roasters, most roasters do not have money, right? Most roasters are small or operations like myself or maybe a little bit bigger um, or even smaller. And it's just like in politics, right? We talk about like American politics, like oh, there's 535 representatives in Congress. Why aren't they doing things more for the people? Because the people don't pay them. Yeah, yeah, we pay them through taxes. They get their salaries, they get their $180,000, whatever it is. But that's, let's be honest, that's, that's pittance. It's a pittance. It's, it's, it's laughable. Not when you've got all the, uh, several individuals, a few, a, f a small percentage of individuals in America that can actually give them money, that can finance their campaigns. Those are the people they're beholden to. And so the SCAA, you know, if they were to focus on farmers and roasters that have no money, how do they make money? That is the, you know, Taxation with represent, without representation. That's the name of the game here. <laughs> 400 was the last 990. Does that mean that 990 is what they're paying now? 990, really? Almost a million dollars to be executive director of the SCA? That would be... We should become executive director of the SCA then. Anyway. Enough about that. So... If you have the time this weekend, come to the SCA in, in Chicago. There's actually a number of events that are happening around the the event. So um, what is it? I think Saturday, I don't I don't have it in my calendar yet, but I was just looking at a, a piece, a blurb. Saturday, there's a Nova Simonelli is having a big event. There's a lot of the companies will have big events. So you can go to those and hang out and meet more coffee people. So Omniel, if you're going to be there and this is your first time to SCA, a lot of those things are available. If anyone else is coming. Let me know. I'll be around. I'll be around. Um, oh, oh, oh uh, JJ says, no, on the, the last form 990 they filed that ED was making 400. Okay. Okay. Well, 400 still. I would be happy with 400. I have a nicer t-shirt at least with $400,000 in, uh, in my salary. And you know what? Maybe I'd, 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 be, I'd be willing to be compromised. Be like, okay, I don't I don't need altruistic stuff. <laughs> Altruism is for those that don't make that kind of money. <laughs> Omnil says, thank you for the insight. Hopefully running into, yeah, hopefully running into the show. It'd be awesome. Yeah, you've had to work. All right, so, but really there's not going to be too much because it's already 49 minutes and I need to get rolling because I've got some deliveries to do. I got a lot of stuff to finish because I've got my, I got to jump to the airport tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. to make the flight to Chicago. So if you have the time to come to Chicago, let me know. And uh, yeah, otherwise there is, a, I did put a, since I'll be traveling for the next nine days, I've got a schedule in the description when we're going to have um, live streams. We will not have a live stream tomorrow. We will not have a live stream on Monday because Monday I'll be traveling from Chicago to Las Vegas, but we should be able to do live streams pretty much every day after that for next week. All right. So Michael, thank you very much. Good to see all of you guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Hope you have a wonderful day out there. And uh, see you soon.